On the 6th of May, 1935, King George V celebrated his Silver Jubilee. It was a momentous day for the grandson of Queen Victoria. Newsreel cameras and cheering crowds lined the procession route, and commemorative magazines devoted page after page to the royal couple, with their four sons, a daughter, and several grandchildren. But one face and one name was missing. John Charles Francis, the king's youngest son, had died 16 years earlier, aged just 13. He had suffered from epilepsy and was most likely autistic. Had Prince John lived, he would have been the present Queen's uncle, and yet at least one official version of the House of Windsor family tree does not include him, which has led many to believe that Prince John was an embarrassment the royal family wanted to hide. There's a strange ruthlessness about the House of Windsor which there doesn't need to be, but for their own reasons, uh, if they have somebody that they feel isn't up to scratch, they want to write them out of the history books. It happened in the case of Prince John. The moment that he died, we hear no more about him. Suddenly, the royal family is apparently, if you read the newspapers, uh, a family with five children, not six children. And it's very easy to forget this poor child who died in his teenage years. The mystery of the lost prince has already been dramatised as the tragic story of a young boy stigmatised by his illness and hidden from public view. Oh, no, not today. You don't run today. And a letter written by Prince John's eldest brother seems to confirm the very worst suspicions about how the family dealt with him. On hearing the news of John's death, Prince Edward wrote to his mistress... I've told you all about that little brother, darling, and how he was an epileptic. He's been practically shut up for the last two years anyhow, so no one has ever seen him except the family, and then only once or twice a year. This poor boy had become more of an animal than anything else. The idea of Prince John as a guilty secret ruthlessly shut away by the royal family circulated as rumour for years after, and eventually found its way into print. But now, almost 90 years after Prince John's death, we can tell another story, because according to one of the few people still alive who knew him, the reality was very different. There was an article about Prince John, and I was very angry about it and upset because it said he was locked away, neglected, unhappy and lonely. And it was so untrue because he was a happy little boy doing all sorts of things that he could do. With the help of this first-hand witness and accounts from others, as well as photographs that have never been seen before on television and letters written by Prince John himself, we can now refute many of the myths that have grown up about him in the years since his death. The truth about his life is very different from the story that is commonly told and reveals much more about the extraordinary family life of the Windsors and how they dealt with a public and private tragedy. The path of Prince John's life would be eventually determined by his epilepsy, which was first diagnosed when he was four. But even before then, his upbringing was hardly normal, partly because he was royal, but also because of his parents, George and Mary, two people who, even after years of marriage, could only convey their feelings for one another in the form of letters. Mary and George were almost painfully inhibited about expressing their emotions to each other. I mean, they write, I wish you could say this to me face to face, but they did love each other, and there's absolutely no dispute about that. George and Mary and their six children had their family home at Sandringham, but not in the grand house. George, a former naval man, preferred a cramped little place called York Cottage. It was said that its warren of small rooms reminded him of life aboard ship. It is an extraordinary place. It's rather like a villa in Bournemouth. It's all kind of higgledy-piggledy. It's pebble dash and timbers. And it's really not big at all. And how on earth that family fitted in with all their children 
their servants, their nannies and governesses, the Aquarius. I mean, it is quite unbelievable. Prince John and his siblings grew up in two rooms on the first floor, separated from the adult world by a green baize door. They saw their mother for an hour each day, their father even less. All the same, the household was dominated by his fearsome personality. George had a passion for order and military discipline. He was obsessed by collecting stamps and shooting game. He was one of the finest shots in the country. And he applied all the same rigors of precision and attention to detail to his children, who were drilled in proper conduct from an early age. George also had an explosive temper. Well, he was gruff um, and he was liable to tell you off for quite unexpected and one could think very small misdemeanors. One had to be fairly quiet as a little boy. I remember he barked very loudly indeed when I sneezed once. And he was tremendously cross at, at, at the notion that somebody would risk having a cold round about him. Um, and I was bustled out. George was undoubtedly a bullying and disciplinarian father. And particularly for his sons, he did give them hell because he was constantly setting certain ridiculous standards in turnout, in dress, in behaviour. He didn't mean to be cruel, but it offended him if in any way they slipped below what he felt to be the immutable essential standards for, for, for members of the royal family, above all for future kings. Although the elder sons were evidently cowed into conforming, it would appear from John's expression as he's supposed to be practicing drill that he remained insubordinate and unafraid. As much as George was an overbearing father, Mary seems to have been unusually detached in her relationships with her children. As a young woman, she had cultivated a formal reserve to disguise her shyness, but it made her a less than ideal mother. She went through life in a kind of psychological suit of armor, which prevented her ever demonstrating the real warmth and capacity for love which she did have within her. And I think was to her children, she must have seemed a very distant figure. And as a dutiful royal wife, she deferred to her husband in every way, at some cost to her children and herself. She didn't perhaps protect the children from his rages and his severity as much as she should have. He really was quite bad at times. There's stories of how he shouted so much at her over the dinner table, lunch table, that she just got up in silent protest. But although she may have had to endure his rages, Mary certainly shared George's love of order and tidiness. She was slightly mad, I think, Mary. I mean, it's a word that's not often used about her, but underneath she was, you know, borderline mad. She tore ivy off other people's walls because she hated the disorder of nature. And now that's quite a strange thing to do. So we're talking about a, a ferocious a little king, very small in stature, shouting, and a restless, caged energy in Mary, and somebody who was not normal, even for the royal family. <laughs> Looking back, Prince Edward remembered his childhood as wretched, and there's little doubt that the corresponding stresses of a disciplinarian father and a distant mother had terrible consequences for the royal children in later life. The Prince of Wales, did have the most extravagant wish to be slim, almost, one might say, to the point of bulimia. He was haunted by this belief that he was getting fat for no possible reason. George's second son, Prince Albert, had to endure corrections to what were seen as his physical faults. His legs were put in metal splints to straighten his knock knees, and although naturally left-handed, he was forced to use his right, which may even have caused the stammer that he struggled with all his adult life. At a time when 
when The Duke of Gloucester, next son down, was in the end a drunkard. Prince George, uh, bisexual, drug addict, uh, a man who loved many people, but somehow could never find his place in the order of things. But Prince John escaped the strain put on his brothers, at first because he was the youngest, and later because of his epilepsy, which meant he was in the constant care of his devoted nanny, Charlotte Bill. She had nursed all of George and Mary's children, and her name had been shortened by the royal infants to simply Lala. In Prince John's time, nannies were quite strict, and Lala Bill was definitely one of those traditional British nurses, which is perhaps not the cuddly relationship that we expect now. It didn't mean they didn't love, and for a lot of upper-class children and some royal ones, Nanny was the most loving thing they had. A fairly consistent picture emerges of her being very plain speaking, very forthright. Um, she beat the royal children when they were small and if they disobeyed. But somebody of enormous loyalty and a person of great honesty and capable of, of massive love, obviously, that she showed with Johnny. So, I mean, since he had the perfect person with him. When Prince John was rediscovered by the independent newspaper, the version of his story it retold was that because of his epilepsy, he had been hidden away all his life and rarely photographed. But we now know this was not true. Prince John did not suffer from epilepsy in his early childhood, and far from being shut away, he was deliberately made visible by his father, George, who was keen to present his children to the public as an ideal royal family. Prince John was as much of a public figure as any royal child. You can chronicle his life from a little tiny baby in a cradle right through until the year before he died in photographs which were available to the public. And they would have been published in magazines. They were certainly published on picture postcards which were very popular. As well as formal family portraits, there are even snapshots of Prince John out on a shopping trip, and newspaper accounts of the time describe him saluting soldiers and enjoying a Punch and Judy show. Seeing these pictures, no one could have guessed that Prince John began suffering epileptic seizures at the age of four. The attacks continued for the rest of his life, becoming more frequent and more severe as he grew older. This film of patients with epilepsy was taken in the early 1900s. Epilepsy is a disorder of the brain. In the worst cases, it causes episodes of violent convulsions. Sufferers are unconscious during an attack. In Prince John's time, there was no effective treatment. The indignity these patients suffer as they are manhandled for the camera is also a sign of the lack of understanding that existed. We have to see epilepsy in the context of the age, in the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. Epilepsy was stigmatized much more than it is today. We still have some stigma, but it was much more at this time. Indeed, the, the word epileptic was used as a derogatory term. People were referred as feeble-minded, uh, insane imbeciles, uh, and this was more or less used interchangeable with epilepsy. And yet, alarming as Prince John's diagnosis must have been for George and Mary, it was not an immediate cause for despair. This was not, in fact, the first instance of epilepsy in the family. George's uncle, Leopold, had been diagnosed with a mild form when he was 13. And although he had not been able to join the forces like his brothers, he had gone on to university at Oxford and had led a comparatively normal life. And it seems that George and Mary must have thought that John's life might not be so badly affected because it was in the time after he was first diagnosed that he was at his most visible. When his grandfather, Edward VII, died in May 1910, Prince John watched the funeral procession in full view of the crowds from a platform outside Marlborough House. <laughs> 
and with his father and mother, the new king and queen, he often found himself in the company of important guests where, to his father's frustration, he behaved with his customary impudence. The former American president, Theodore Roosevelt, witnessed one such incident. Toward the end of lunch, the children came in. The king was telling me about them in advance. They are all obedient except John. I don't understand it. Now you watch when he comes in. He will go straight for that cake. In came the children, and sure enough, John made a beeline for the cake. The king turned to me with an air of pride in the way the event had justified the prophecy. There, didn't I tell you so? Now listen to the way he answers me. John, what? Don't say what when I speak to you. Come here, turning to me. Didn't I tell you so? He's not obedient, and all the other children are so obedient. John had always had an untamable spirit, but it's clear from anecdotes like this that people were beginning to notice that he was different. Prince John, always described as a nice little boy by people who remembered him at Balmoral. The only thing that did strike them was that when they went for walks, he would be roped to his nurse and the other children thought, hmm, sissy. Of course, no one outside the royal household knew Prince John was epileptic. That was kept secret until after his death. And it is possible that he suffered from other mental problems, although it has never been acknowledged. Epilepsy is not really a disease on its own right. It's what we call symptom complex. It's usually part and parcel of some damage to the brain. Epilepsy and learning disabilities, for instance, they often are associated. And it's fair to say that up to maybe 30% of people with epilepsy will have some form of learning disability. As much as Prince John seems to have been determined not to behave properly at times, it may be that he simply didn't understand he needed to. Elsie Hollingsworth, who knew John when he was a teenager, noticed something else about his behaviour. He seemed to enjoy simple, repetitive activities. Mother had a collecting box which said on it for the waifs and strays. And Prince John called it for the whales and strays. And he used to love to sit with a big pile of farthings and put them all in the box one at a time. And he loved doing these little things like that. Repetitive behavior can also be a sign of autism. I think he was on what we would now say the autistic spectrum um, and that he had um, semantic chromatic disorder, um, which is a form of language difficulty, which doesn't mean he can't understand what he's being said, doesn't mean he's shut off from the world, doesn't mean that he um, isn't able to empathise with other people's emotions, which is all the things that are normally associated with autism, a, a severe form of a certain form of autism, but he wasn't able to express his thoughts. He had a problem, almost like English was a foreign language to him, and that he was speaking it rather badly and writing it rather badly. This is one of the few surviving examples of Prince John's handwriting. It once belonged to his nanny, Lala. We can't be sure how old John was when he wrote this note, but there are clues elsewhere that his educational development began to suffer as he grew older and that this, as much as his epilepsy, would have a profound effect on his future. In May 1912, Prince John's brother George was sent away to boarding school at Broadstairs. He was nearest in age to John and his closest sibling. At seven years old, Prince John was left as the only son still at home and still in the care of his nanny. Then, the following summer, the Times published a statement from the palace which shows that John's parents now had serious doubts about his ability to lead a normal life. When the King and Queen visited Prince Henry and Prince George at Broadstairs a few days ago, a report was published, not in the Times, that their majesties had arranged for their youngest son, Prince John, to attend next term the school at which his elder brothers had been studying there. It is officially stated that this is entirely inaccurate, it has not been decided that Prince John shall go to school at Broadstairs at all, and it is quite certain that he will not go there next term. <laughs> <laughs> 
the decision not to send John to school was a turning point. After 1913, the direction of his life began to turn away from a conventional royal upbringing towards a more uncertain future that would eventually see him sent away to live separately from the rest of his family. And one of the most significant factors in that fateful decision would be the unexpected and terrible events that began to unfold in Europe in the summer of 1914. As the First World War began in 1914, Prince John was still living with his parents. But even he, at nine years old, would feel the impact of the conflict in Europe. For the next four years, almost the rest of John's life, the King's official duties and the Queen's devotion to the war effort would take them away from their youngest son, just as his condition was worsening. At the same time, John was becoming isolated from his siblings, who were either away at boarding school or in the services. And as he lost touch with his family, so he began to disappear from public view. There certainly is a tailing off in the, the public profile of John in terms of the photographs that appear to have been published. You don't see the formal portraits of John after about 1913, 14. But what you do see is the occasional photograph by a local photographer. And this was a series that would have been taken at Sandringham in about 1915. That one I always feel that John looks slightly ill. There's a tension in the way he's holding his hands that I think might point to his not being as well as perhaps he was earlier. It is known that Prince John's epileptic seizures became more severe as he grew older, and it had always been thought that after his brothers and sister had moved away from York Cottage, he must have had a very sad and lonely existence. But it has now come to light that this was not the case because of a life-changing decision Queen Mary took on her son's behalf. Breaking completely with royal protocol, she began to choose child companions for Prince John from among the families of ordinary estate workers. One was Winifred Thomas. My mother went to Sandringham from Halifax because she had uh, very bad asthma and living in a smoky town, um, being the youngest of, of four children, it was thought that it would be very nice for her to go and live in the country um, with her aunt and uncle who lived at Sandringham. George Stratton was a groom and lived in Stable Cottage with his wife Elizabeth or Lizzie. They had no children, so my mother went down to live with them. Queen Mary, who knew my aunt through living on the estate, um, went to visit her. Uh, to meet my mother and see if uh, she would like to um, play with Prince John sometimes. And it was from that that she began to know Prince John. They did exchange photographs quite frequently as gifts and sign them. I don't exactly know how old he is in this photograph, but he's written his name in between lines that have been written to help him. And this is one of the ones that my mother had of him. So it's probably round about the early time of my mother knowing him. Traditionally, royal playmates are chosen from the children of members of the household, which would be maybe the Queen's private secretary. I mean, not, not estate workers' children, which of course actually John's companions were. So I think it's very unusual for a, a royal child in that era. He obviously couldn't deal with his own social peers at all. So if he mixed with just ordinary children, he'd be much more at ease and they would be far more patient with him and not unkind to him. I suppose they didn't want people talking about him. And if it was confined to children that lived in the area and weren't moving around in the social circles of London, there was going to be no talk of Prince John's illness. Away from the rigid conventions and harsh conformity of royal life, Prince John was able to form friendships that would normally have been impossible, and he became known throughout the estate. My uncle used to take them out in the pony and trap sometimes, and uh, 
They used to go to Dursingham and buy sweets at the sweet shop. She found him to be a very happy little boy and uh, a very normal little boy. Well, this little letter was for Mr. Stratton from John when he was living at York Cottage in Sandringham. My great uncle, of course he was, my mother's uncle, had fallen and broken his arm in a riding accident. And this is a little letter from John. And he says, Dear Mr. Stratton, well, he's run out of space for the end, but he's got it on the envelope. I hope your arm is better. Are you going to church with my love from John? It's, and there's one spelling mistake, which I think is charming because the family allowed it. It's, it's a very sweet little letter and my uncle obviously treasured it. Although it's impossible to date this letter precisely, we do know that Prince John's formal education effectively ended at the age of 11, when the last of his tutors was dismissed. He'd been unable to make any progress, which suggests that the learning difficulties associated with John's epilepsy were quite serious. That summer, 1916, Prince John passed into the sole care of his nanny, Lala Bill. From this time onwards, he was very rarely seen outside the closed world of the Sandringham estate. It was the fact that if he really was um, uh, very low in, in the IQ, in, the, in what they would call the imbecile class, that was a real problem for them because it reflected on, on the royal family. It could be a public embarrassment should people find out and then they would start saying, oh, you know, there's a strain of madness in the royal family. This is sort of going on in the background since the madness of King George III. So obviously they didn't want that. And then I think personally they found it difficult that they had a handicapped child. They weren't the kind of people who could cope with that. It would seem like a sort of slur on them somehow that this could happen. Having enthusiastically embraced the idea of his children as a very public royal family, there's little doubt that King George would have been especially concerned about the perception of his youngest son. King George V viewed illness as something which was inappropriate to remember the royal family. I suspect that deep within himself, King George V felt that Prince John had failed some sort of royal test of stamina. He was, he was letting down the family and must therefore be got out of the firing line and kept in comfortable, decent, cherished seclusion. And so, in January 1917, Prince John was sent with his nanny, Lala Bell, and a retinue of staff to live in the village of Wolferton. Wood Farm, his new home, is about three miles from York Cottage, but still within the Sandringham estate. The decision to send John to live separately is one of the most controversial moments in his story, and it has often been portrayed as a coldly callous act by his parents. They apparently thought that a more rural environment would be best for him, and certainly George and Mary were less unkind than some. What they wanted to do was do something better than most of the aristocratic families of Great Britain, who, if they had a dud child, which is what they call them, they would put them in a home. I mean, for example, the, the Queen Mother's family, uh, two Bose Lions girls were pushed into uh, um, an, an asylum and declared dead. If you looked in Burke's peerage, you would find that they were dead. In fact, they weren't dead, they were, they were still alive. But families had this terrible idea uh, that if there was something wrong with a child, you banish them. Although not institutionalised, Prince John did spend the last two years of his life almost exclusively at Wood Farm. But he was still making new friends, and it was at this time that he first met Elsie Hollingsworth. Her father was John's coachman. He was very kind, nice boy. We liked him. We understood that he was slow and backward and helped him. But he could do things. Once a, well, a painter had left his ladder up against the window upstairs and went away and Prince John saw it and climbed up it. Johnny, 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 come down here. And I remember what an anxious time that was. 
people all running around down below. I'm afraid he'd leave go and fall off, but they got him down in the end. He thought it was very funny. Prince John's life was secluded, but at the same time he could enjoy a freedom and informality that would never normally be open to royal children. When my father went into the army, there was a flu epidemic, and my mother and brother and I all caught it. And she had us wrapped up and taken over to Wood Farmhouse so that they could look after us. There were three servants, and the, she had us there in bed. Prince John brought us up cups of tea. And I remember he just dropped one lot once. And Mrs. Bill shouted at him. And I thought, oh, fancy being able to shout at a prince. Prince John did still have some contact with his royal relatives. His elderly, deaf grandmother, Queen Alexandra, lived alone at Sandringham House. She understood his need for family contact. And she also gave him a hobby. Once a week, my father would drive Prince John the mile to Sandringham House, and he would spend the afternoon with, Prince, with his grandmother, Queen Alexandra. And he had part of a big flower bed made into a garden for him, where he could dig and plant things, as he loved doing. He liked to be busy doing things. And the gardeners would then dig up the plants he'd put in and put in ones that were about to flower. So when he came the next week, it, they would all be in flower and he could pick them. It never occurred to him that it was odd in one week. Plants had grown flowers that he could be picking. He just took it for granted. And the garden gave Prince John a way of keeping in touch with his parents who were now so often away. The flowers he picked were sent as gifts in letters that still survive. I was able to look at the letters that Johnny had written to his parents, and the flowers were still pressed tightly on, and they were in immaculate condition, these letters. They fell off the flowers as, as I looked at them. So since Mary and, um, had read the letters, Queen Mary, um, probably they had been filed away, and I don't know if anybody had ever asked to see them. John's constant companion throughout these final years was his nanny, Lala Bill. And it seems he saw almost nothing of his siblings as his epilepsy grew worse. In one of her few reported comments, Lala later said, We dare not let him be with his brothers and sister because it upsets them so much, with the attacks getting so bad and coming so often. But his parents, George and Mary, are more open to criticism. It's not so much the isolation, but the fact that he wasn't visited often. Now, that one could be much more critical of. I mean, that's the poignancy of the story, that it wasn't like that he was this so um, disabled child that nobody could cope with it. That was not the point. He, he clearly remained a lovable child right to the end, but they just didn't have time for historical reasons, the First World War, and, and for emotional reasons that Mary couldn't really talk to any of her children, least of all Johnny. You know. Stephen Polyakov portrayed John as being visited only rarely by his parents. Why is there ivy growing there? I'm sorry? Others have gone even further, claiming that he never saw his mother and father again. But that's not how his friend Elsie remembers it. It was so untrue, because my father would come in and say the king and queen had been to visit Prince John today or tell us whoever it was, as we weren't allowed to look out of the window and see them. And they were often there when they were down. And then every time he went to Sandringham, they was often taken up to Sandringham when they were there. He saw he spent the day with them and saw a lot of them. So it was quite untrue. In fact, almost the only information we have directly from the royal family about their feelings for Prince John dates from the time of his death. Tragically, that would come just as the war that had separated him from his parents and siblings finally came to an end. And it's some of the most shocking evidence in the whole story.
Christmas 1918 was an especially festive occasion after four years of war. Prince John always spent Christmas Day with his family at Sandringham, although he would be driven back to his own home, Wood Farm, at night. The doctors had previously told the King and Queen their diagnosis was that John would not survive into adulthood. But because epilepsy is so unpredictable, no one could have anticipated when his death might come. King George and Queen Mary were still at home on the estate when, on the afternoon of Saturday, January the 18th, 1919, Prince John died suddenly after a final massive epileptic seizure. Mary wrote later that she and George arrived at Wood Farm to find Lala distraught and John lying peacefully still. For him, she told a friend, it was a great release and he had been spared much suffering. King George described it simply as the greatest mercy possible. This is a photograph that my mother said that he had given her but it's not signed. And this is the last photograph she had from him. And uh, my mother wasn't there when he died. She had gone home to Yorkshire to stay with the family for Christmas. She hadn't known that he was going to die then. I mean, he had not been ill when she left to go to Halifax, but of course he could be ill at any time. On the Monday after Prince John's death, January the 20th, the Daily Mirror devoted its entire front page to the news. Inside was a public statement from the royal doctor revealing for the first time that the prince had suffered from epilepsy. The funeral at Sandringham Church the following day was purposely low-key. The king and queen had requested a private service, but local villagers and staff from the estate still came to pay their respects. All the staff went to the funeral. It was a small church at Sandringham, but my aunt said every single person on the estate went and stood around the gates. And his grave was absolutely covered in flowers afterwards. The next day, Queen Mary went again to his grave and to Wood Farm, which was still filled with his belongings. Later, in her diary, she let slip her usual reserve, writing simply, Missed the dear child there very much indeed. It was very moving, suddenly see something, as emotion burst out, and the fact that she missed somebody who she'd hardly seen over the last three or four years. She loved her boy, and when he was gone, she realised how much she missed him. It was rumoured for many years after Prince John's death that the royal family regarded him as a shameful embarrassment because of his epilepsy and apparent learning difficulties. But it was not until 1996 and the discovery of a series of letters written by Prince Edward that there was any firm evidence. On the 20th of January, 1919, two days after Prince John's death, Edward wrote to his mistress. I've told you all about that little brother, darling, and how he was an epileptic and might have gone west any day. He's been practically shut up for the last two years anyhow, so no one's ever seen him except the family, and then only once or twice a year. And his death is the greatest relief imaginable and what we've all silently prayed for. But to be plunged into mourning for this is the limit just as the war is over, which cuts parties, etc., right out. No one would be more cut up if any of my other three brothers were to die than I should be. But this poor boy had become more of an animal than anything else. It was a shocking revelation. But how much did it reflect the feelings of the rest of John's family, in particular his parents? The best clue is in another letter from Edward, this time to Queen Mary, which has never actually been seen. The Prince of Wales wrote to his mother a letter which does not survive, but which must have been of daunting insensitivity. It completely failed to take into account the fact that this was a mother who had lost a son and was deeply grieving it. 
Although we don't know the content of the letter, we do know that Queen Mary's reaction forced Edward to write again, apologizing for having been so cold-hearted. Edward's callousness remained a private matter for many years, but the idea of a secret weakness in the royal family took hold in the public imagination 17 years later, when John's brother Albert was about to be crowned as King George VI, and sinister gossip began to circulate. And certainly when George VI was facing his coronation, rumours were quite strong that he wouldn't be able to carry it through because he was subject to falling fits. Now, I don't think he ever was. I think that this was some part confabulating, really, Prince John's epilepsy. So the rumour was there, the knowledge was around. But in fact, historically, much of the knowledge about Prince John has been based on hearsay and rumour precisely because so few details of his life and his problems have ever been disclosed. And that may be a sign of the true attitude within the Windsor family to the kinds of difficulties he suffered from. I think the royal family have a, a, a problem of dealing with anything that's out of the ordinary. For instance, Princess Diana's bulimia. They didn't know what it was, they didn't understand it, they'd never even heard of postnatal depression. And there was a photograph of Princess Margaret sitting in her wheelchair on the Queen Mother's birthday and felt she shouldn't have been there, shouldn't have been seen, because that's the way it was always done. And I think there is a certain amount of he head in the sand stuff. And if you don't think about it or talk about it, it'll go away. But in Prince John's case, the absence of information in all the years since his death has only encouraged sceptical journalists and historians to imagine the very worst and John's story has taken on a life of its own. The ways in which Prince John has been remembered after his death have developed... Well, they have taken some quite bizarre turns and, and some very cruel ones. There's one theory which says he was a sort of monster, he was too big for his age. Anyone who looks at a photograph will know that that's simply not true, but it's still repeated. One book describes how he had long hair because it couldn't be cut and his fingernails couldn't be cut. And again, this is just ludicrous. Ultimately, Prince John has become an object of fascination because he seems to represent a dark, disturbing secret in the midst of the House of Windsor. Whether his life was an embarrassment written out of history by an anxious royal family, or a private sadness that was quietly allowed to fade from public memory. The result has been the same. He has become a semi-fictionalised figure whose life is usually portrayed either as tragedy or conspiracy. The person who was closest to him throughout his life was his nanny, Lala Bill. She remained faithfully loyal to the royal family and disclosed very little. She died in 1964 at the age of 89. Lala never married or had any children of her own, but she clearly cherished her own memories of the young prince. Until the end of her life, she kept a large photograph of him hanging over the mantelpiece. She also had a short handwritten note. It read simply, Nanny, I love you. Johnny. Johnny.